Uh, I'm Thomas, and I'm here on instead of the, the session chair, Jean-Marc Gautier, who unfortunately got caught up in traffic, but I'm very excited to welcome all of you in a paper session for 3D modeling and authoring. We have two papers in this session, and this time I'd like to invite Andreas Berenson uh, to present a paper on signifier-based immersive and interactive 3D modeling. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, this is, is joint work with um, Gabriel Friesman from my own university and, and Karen Singh from the University of Toronto. So, now uh, some of you might be wondering uh, what exactly is signifier based uh, 3D modeling and uh, why should you care? And uh, let's, let's maybe start with a care bit. Um, why indeed? So, I think that, that part of the reason is that well, we want to do 3D modeling, of course. And, uh, and now we can actually do it in, in virtual reality because the new head-mounted displays are high resolution. We can actually see the 3D model. And also, perhaps even more importantly, we have controllers with a six degree of freedom of hand tracking. And that's actually hugely important because it means that, that we can now uh, use the controllers to control virtual hands. And it works quite, quite convincingly. This is really uh, the Oculus Touch controllers basically gave us that. And going forward, uh, it seems that, that computer vision based hand tracking will mean that we might not even have to use controllers anymore. And, um, and as you will see shortly, hands are really important in, in this uh, 3D modeling system. But of course, it's not necessarily easy to do uh, 3D modeling well in virtual reality. And um, I'd like to just consider a particular challenge, uh, which is that uh, 3D modeling generally relies on extremely elaborate interfaces. So what I've shown you here is just, just an image from, uh, from the internet uh, showing, showing Blender. Of course, you might say, well, Blender doesn't just do 3D modeling. It, it also does rendering and a simulation and a bunch of things. But, but still, even if we take that out, just the interface for 3D modeling is fairly complicated. Uh, and of course, it relies on a lot of widgets, a lot of windows with various menus and controls and whatnot. And I would, I would sort of uh, posit that uh, widgets, they really break presence in, in virtual reality. And I think that the best illustration I've seen of that is actually from popular fiction. Maybe some of you have seen the movie called Jumanji, where uh, a bunch of teenagers get sucked into a computer game. And inside the computer game, they discover that if they, if they touch their, their pectorals, all of a sudden a window will appear floating in thin air, uh, showing them their player stats. And, uh, I mean, this is used for comical effect, but it's really the bane of our existence in virtual reality because, of course, this is an example of a break of presence. They suddenly discover that they're not in some sort of magical universe, they're inside a computer game. And so what I really want to do is to avoid these floating windows and, and sort of abstract widgets that are, to my mind, just a distraction. So how do we do that? Well, perhaps we can uh, work with very direct interfaces. Um, and, and let's look a little bit at, at what, what it means that an interface is, is direct. There's a quite uh, inspiring paper, I think, by, by Hutchins, Holland, and Norman, uh, where, they, where they discuss directness. And uh, essentially, they, uh, they talk about two aspects uh, to directness. The first is the notion of distance. So basically, if an, if an interface is uh, very direct, uh, the gulf of execution and the gulf of evaluation is not so big. So what this means is that I have some intent, uh, I issue a command, and then something happens, for instance, to my 3D model. Now, if the, if the gulf is wide, then there's a big difference between how I issue the command and, and what actually happens. Um, and correspondingly, the gulf of evaluation is wide if there's a big difference between what happens and how I uh, sort of evaluate the, the results. Uh, so, so this is related to cognitive effort. If, if, if I have to sort of think hard to understand these two gulfs, well, it's not very direct. Um, the other aspect, which is perhaps even more intuitive, is that, uh, and this is a quote, the goal is to permit the user to act as if the representation is the thing itself. Uh, and, and I think that, that this is really captured very well by the, uh, by the common 
icons that we use to manipulate, say, files. So, so basically, if I if I grab a, an icon and pull it to the dustbin, uh, I delete it. We all know that. We don't think about it as moving pixels to uh, some other pixels, but in fact, that's what we're doing, right? We think about it as deleting the file. So really, the icon becomes, for us, the file. Uh, so maybe we can create 3D modeling systems that are very, very direct in this sense, where we basically don't really perceive the interface because we think of it as, as being the, the modeling tools themselves. Unfortunately, this has already been done. So um, Oculus Medium is a great system. Uh, I like it myself. My daughter really loves it. Uh, and, and in Oculus Medium, you have these tools that are loosely based on, on clay and uh, spray paint tools. And uh, you can basically uh, spray paint uh, clay in, in thin air. And, and of course, this is extremely direct because uh, you, you actually see a model of the controller you're already holding in your hand, and, and it's sort of attached to a little clay gun that, that sprays clay into thin air. So that's cool. But the thing is, though, that, that uh, this is a volume sculpting tool. There's a voxel grid underneath somewhere. And, and the result is that you get these really dense meshes with probably millions or at least hundreds of thousands of polygons. And in many cases, we would like to model somewhat more parsimonious 3D models. For instance, if you want to use them later for uh, computer animation in games or whatnot. Now, that has also been done. So we have, um, we have Google Blocks. Probably you're also familiar with that. Um, and Google Blocks basically is a mesh editing tool, and, and very close to what uh, what I intend to, uh, what we intended to do. Um, it's still uh, very direct, but now the metaphor seems a little less obvious because we don't really have three D meshes in the real world like we have clay, and it's not it's not quite as obvious uh, what what these pliers that you are editing. What, what they really represent. Uh, you use the pliers basically for all of the editing operations, whether you are extruding a face, you're moving a vertex, or, or whatever you might be doing, splitting an edge, uh, splitting a face, as you see. So, <clears throat> the thought really was, maybe we can do something that's different from this. And specifically, we were thinking, maybe instead of having this magical plier, maybe we could make the, the object that we model, maybe we can turn that into its own tool for changing itself. So maybe we can sort of remove the distinction between the object we're modeling and the tool that we are using to manipulate the object. So this sounds a little bit like an interesting design task, right? That, that we, we want to design some controls that can somehow be embedded in the object that we are modeling. And, and we actually try to, to think of this in terms of, uh, of, of design. And it so turned out that I had been introduced uh, by the last author, actually, to, to this book uh, called The Design of Everyday Things by, by Donald Norman, which I think is, is really a great book on design and very accessible. So in the first edition of the book, Norman introduces the notion of affordances. So what's an affordance? Well, it's basically uh, the properties of an object that are imbued by the material and the geometry of the object. So if you have a, a glass, uh, for instance, Glass has the affordance that you can break it, breakability. Uh, if it's a glass cup, it, it can also hold liquid and you can drink from it. Um, now, Norman realized that the people were thinking about this a little bit wrong when it came to user interfaces. People were thinking, oh, an affordance is what I can, I can do with an object. So if I place a button somewhere in my interface, that's actually an affordance. But that wasn't really what he had in mind because, of course, the button is just showing you that that there is some possibility. It's not the possibility itself. So in the, in the second edition of the book, Norman defined affordances as the relationship between a thing and the one that produced the thing. So a cup, for instance, has the affordance that I can pick it up and drink from it. But if I were a mouse, say, I wouldn't be able to do that because I would be too small to pick up the cup and also not the hands. So, uh, so that, that kind of shows you that the affordance is really a relation between the one that produced the thing and the thing itself. It's not an inherent property necessarily of the object. But then of course we need another word for how people, for the things that make people know that an affordance exists. And that's signifiers. So signifiers basically is any clue as to 
uh, what the affordances might be. And it could be uh, sort of uh, unintentional clues or perceived affordances, but it could also be uh, clues that were put there very deliberately. So that's really our starting point. We're thinking, okay, we want the object to be a machine for manipulating itself. And we need to put some signifiers on the object that make it clear what we can do. Now, what is it that we can do? Well, it's a mesh, right? And, um, and one of the things we definitely wanted to do was to do face extrusion. So basically, take a quad and, and put it out to add more, more geometry. And uh, face extrusion is a little bit like pulling out a drawer. So uh, the signifier came quite naturally. If we just put a pull handle on the faces of the 3D model, then people would see those pull handles, perceive them as signifiers, and say, oh, I can probably pull this handle. What does it do? Oh, it extrudes. That's, that's natural, we hoped. Uh, likewise, uh, we could put little knobs on the vertices, and then people would go, hmm, looks like I can grab and move this little vertex. And indeed, they can, uh, thereby editing the, the vertex positions. So that's basically, that's basically our starting point. And with that starting point, we we're hoping to, to basically turn uh, the, the 3D model into a magically reconfiguring machine. So the user would grab a handle, perform an extrusion, and then the shape would reconfigure, more handles would be added, and, uh, and the user could, could proceed with the more modeling operations. Um, so, <clears throat> of course, Moving vertices and, and uh, extruding faces is not quite enough, so we came up with a bunch of, of possible operations. This is just to give you an overview of what they are. Um, and now let's consider them in a little bit more detail. So face extrusion, of course, is the, it's really the thing we started with. Um, you grab a handle, a pull to extrude, and of course, we sometimes want to be a little bit precise. And it's not immediately obvious that you can just be precise, because if you just pull out, what if you pull a little bit to the side? Uh, well, we've, we've introduced some snapping features to make it possible to be precise. So basically, it'll snap to orientation, so the face orientation will stay constant when you pull out. It'll snap to normal direction, you're actually pulling out in the normal direction. And there are also some ticks you can see. When you start pulling, there's a tape measure that suddenly appears on the sides of the, uh, of the faces that you are extruding out. And, uh, and you, can, you can snap some things. Actually, it so happens that if you lift your thumb, uh, you, can, you can turn off this snapping and then you can do sort of arbitrary extrusions. Um, that's not quite obvious, so more work to do. Of course, people also sometimes want to extrude more than just uh, just a single face. So um, we also wanted to make this possible. And the way we did it was to add some some so-called latches. So basically, uh, there are some little yeah we call them latches that you can you can touch them with your index finger and then they close and turn red. And that basically means that you formed a selection set and the two faces that are adjacent to the edge whose latch you have closed, uh, they'll belong to the selection set. And then if you, if you pull the handle of just one of these two faces, then you extrude uh, both of them. And actually these, these latches lead to what I think is a fairly sophisticated uh, selection set tool, because these sets are persistent. If I've performed an extrusion with, of, of two faces that are latched together, um, I can perform a new extrusion and, and sort of keep on going as long as I, I would like. Um, and of course I can have multiple selection sets just by having different clusters of faces that are connected by latches. Uh, but of course they must always be contiguous. I can't have a selection set created in this way where one face is not connected by a, an edge with a closed latch to some other faces. So, uh, that could be perceived as a downside. But I think it's pretty nice that we're able to have multiple selection sets that are persistent after uh, operations have been performed. Of course, the face handles the face handles can also be used simply to transform the face. If we, if we disable the snapping, in this case, you just, you just change the, uh, the orientation. And uh, that's, that's quite useful for organic sculpting where you're not trying to make something with right angles. 
and then we have we have move vertex, which we already discussed in, in some detail. Um, but but one feature of the of the move vertex operation that we, we realize people might like is that if you move a vertex to another vertex, they actually snap together and, and thereby you form you form triangles. So you can do other things than just quads. Um, and in fact, you can also create uh, you can create three D models of, of complex topology uh, because if you if you pull out a handle and you touch another handle, then instead of an extrusion, you perform a bridging operation between the two faces that are thus connected, and uh, and that can be used to create create objects of, of higher genus than uh, zero. And we realized that, that people, people might really want something that allowed them to model with, with precision. And that's, we'll return to this, but, but that's actually a, a little bit of a challenge with a direct uh, manipulation interface. Because I can't enter a number, say, uh, for how far I want to move something, or a number to indicate the precise angle of, of a face. So, what, what we thought might be a good idea, and it also seems to work quite well, is that you can you can use one hand to sort of sense a face. So you, you touch a face hand, but you don't close your hand around the face hand to, to pull out. Um, and then you grab another face hand. So when you, of course, this is an Oculus touch controller, right? So so there's, uh, there's a grip button, and when you touch the grip button, you close the handle. And that's how you basically grab a handle. I didn't say that before. So basically, if you touch one handle just to sense it and then grab another handle, then it will snap uh, the, the second face you grab to the plane of the face that you're sensing with the other hand. That's what, what you're seeing here. So in this way, you can, you can make faces that lie in the same plane quite easily. You can also use this on vertices. So of course, uh, vertices being, being the zero-dimensional entities they are, we had to do it a little bit differently. So basically, if I sense a vertex, um, it constructs some lines going through the vertex that are aligned with the major axes of the coordinate system. And then when I grab uh, the handle of another vertex, it will basically project that other vertex onto the line uh, passing, through, uh, uh, passing through the other vertex, which is most aligned with the vector from the sensed vertex to the vertex that I grab. So, so that's also quite effective. I find. Finally, uh, we realized that we, we might want some, some operations to, uh, to basically uh, split edges in order to introduce more detail. So you can, you can grab two vertices and twist, and then when you twist, it performs a loop cut. So it splits the, the edge between the two vertices, uh, adding a new vertex, but then it also moves around uh, the face loop uh, defined by the edge that you split and split all edges in that face loop, introducing, uh, so basically the cube here is cut into two rectangular parallel pipettes. So, unfortunately, this is an operation people don't discover, we have, to, we have to tell them. So, we pride ourselves on the discoverability of the features in the system, but it's, it's not quite true of all features. Um, so some, one other thing we pride ourselves on is that, uh, that the system doesn't need any of these floating, floating windows with, with random controls. But of course, we get a little bit into trouble with certain operations. Like, how do you do undo, redo with a system like this? How do you save and load? Uh, how do you perform global transformations of the model? And, uh, and we came up with the idea of a virtual work table. So that's basically our, our cheat <laughs> in, in this system. That we, we place a virtual work table underneath the object being modeled, and um, it has some knobs on the round part that you can use to, to transform, uh, to rotate. If you grab two knobs at once, you can perform scaling and translation. And then you can, can hit undo redo buttons and you can hit load and save buttons. So there are like three save load slots uh, available, which is enough so far. So the work table basically allows us to, to do the, the, the global operations that, that you often don't need to do very much, but you sometimes really need. Undo, of course, you need quite a lot, actually. 
So now I want to show you some uh, a couple of modeling sessions. Um, we're moving very quickly here. Um, so I'm I'm extruding, I'm latching together some faces, extruding again. Yeah, so it's, it's five times speed up, as I think it said. Extruding out the legs of the of the chair, latching some more. Then I'm using the symmetry by sensing on the vertices to make them um, on, lie on the same line. So more symmetry by sensing. This is to sort of make the back of the chair thinner than it would otherwise be. And, uh, yeah, more extrusions. And quite a bit of undo. So this is an, an unedited modeling session. And you see how bridging is used to, to increase the genus of the model. And uh, yeah, there was a subdivision, a loop cut, and, uh, and also some vertex movement, some real advice change, and now I'm pretty much done. Looking at it a little bit with the head to one side. The next uh, modeling session is uh, it's a 3D model. So this is a completely different modeling style. Uh, here it's very organic, so there's a lot of vertex movement. I didn't use that a lot in the previous session. Um, so it's basically almost only extrusion and, and vertex movement. One, one challenge when you're modeling something big is that uh, you know, the model is very far above you when you start uh, when you start doing the lower body and, and the legs. And as we shall see, that that bit me a little bit in, in the end. So doing the hand, a little bit of vertex snapping to create some uh, some triangular faces. You can also see here that that the the handles aren't always very visible. So basically when I'm, I move close to a handle, uh, the handles, or the handles close to the hand, they increase in size to become easier to, to grab. And then the handles far from the hands, uh, they are smaller to, to sort of clutter the model less. It was sort of a little bit of a struggle to make, to make this work without cluttering the model too much. But it seems to work pretty nicely that, that the, the handles scale depending on, on how far away your hand is. Um, and then if you put both hands below the work table, all of the handles disappear, so you don't have to worry about them and you can just look at them all. Right, so I think uh, I'm about happy now. And hit the save button. So this is just uh, showing you the rendered and subdivided models. So here, here they are uh, rendered, and you can see I've mirrored the character model. I, one reviewer was a little bit shocked that there was no mirroring facility in the system, but uh, of course for a, a real system you would have to put that back in, but, or have to put it in, um, but uh, you can also just mirror afterwards, which is good. And here are, a few, uh, here are a few examples. So we were very happy with the system, uh, and uh, it was tested quite a lot. If you look at the paper, you will not find these tests because uh, we were asked by the reviewers to, to remove them. Uh, I think that's fair. Uh, testing uh, is not maybe my forte, uh, but still we did learn something from having people try out the system and I want to share that with you. Uh, so what we learned uh, was that uh, the basic features were indeed very easy to discover. So more than 10 people tried the system and, and none had, had difficulties just finding the, um, the basic features, the extrusion and vertex movement. Um, some of the advanced features could probably be more aligned with signifiers, like like the loop cut feature is not is not easy to discover. So there's there's a little bit more work to do there. Uh, something else that I think is important is that that users with little 3D modeling experience they were really challenged by the by the system, and uh, this worried me a little bit. But I realized that to a large extent this is because 3D modeling is hard. And, and box modeling also is a very particular modeling style where you, uh, you start from a box and you, you sort of you extrude, you move vertices, and 
uh, users who are not familiar with this style of modeling, they often refine the model far too much in the beginning. And this makes it extremely tedious because then they have to move a lot of vertices in order to make the thing uh, turn into what they want. Um, so, so basically we're not claiming that, that the tediousness and, or the intrinsic difficulties of 3D modeling are really uh, ameliorated uh, by, uh, by this system. Another interesting uh, teaching was that, that, uh, that self-intersections had both uh, positive and, and negative effects. Or uh, rather, we have this, this feature in the system that, that if the model self-intersects, we undo the operation. We don't allow users to turn uh, the model into a polygon soup. Um, and that's actually in some ways really nice because you can do playful undo. If you realize, oh, oh what I'm doing here is not going to be nice, then you can just curl up uh, the geometry and let go and, yeah, you know, uh, it'll be undone. But, but also sometimes users wanted to extrude several adjacent faces and then have them snap together and that, that doesn't work. Uh, because they would self-intersect and the operation would be undone. So, some more intelligence in, in dealing with self-intersections is something we're looking at. Uh, also, the, the directness has, has some cost. So, uh, the signifiers are right there on the model. It makes it easy to learn the system, it makes it easy to retain what you can do with the system. Um, and indeed, you're ultimately manip you're almost manipulating uh, the thing itself, as as we discussed earlier. But there's a cost to this, which is that um, first of all, the directness doesn't make the intrinsic uh, difficulty of 3D modeling any easier, and also the user is more responsible for the uh, precision of the modeling operation. You need to introduce uh, constraints if you want to uh, control actions with with precisions. And um, if we are to take, take stock, um, this, this means that, that probably we want to consider uh, some more uh, ways to make modeling precise, like symmetry by sensing or separating degrees of freedom so that you can rotate along around one axis only and not just uh, rotate freely. And of course we want to introduce uh, bilateral symmetry uh, to the system. And uh, well, it's on GitHub if you want to try it out. And with that, I conclude. Thank you. All right, guys, we have done some questions. Any questions? All right. Someone? Okay. So you have this uh, turntable, right? And it's, it's basically clean. So you can't really rotate it uh, along the. So, do you have any any idea how to extend it, maybe to, to, to three dimensions? Uh, it's it's a good point. I, I don't think sort of like the turntable transformations are really the best. Uh, so in Google Docs, you can just grab two points in space and do any transform you like. We could maybe do that, but I'm I'm hesitant to do that because it would sort of break the the way we do things. There's also another point, which is that, that often when you do 3D modeling, you want to separate uh, sort of uh, the, the horizontal rotation from the azimuth and the zenith rotations. You want to separate those. Sure. This is what, what, what Autodesk systems uh, tend to use, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good one. I have a question. What would you say is the biggest added benefit into manipulating things like this in virtual space in comparison to classical desktop systems, right? I, I see a direct problem is the fatigue, but I can see some direct benefits. What would you say is, is the best benefit of it? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and actually, we, uh, we try to, to compare uh, 3D modeling in, in, uh, in Blender and a little system called Wings 3D that I happen to like, and then also in, in our system and in, in Google Docs. And, and one of the comparisons we did was actually counting operations. And it turns out that if you do 3D modeling in virtual reality, uh, there are far fewer operations, which kind of makes sense because, for instance, if I want to change viewpoint, I just, I just move a little bit. So many things actually become much simpler to do in, in VR, and you can model quicker in VR. So I think that it's, it, it leads to a very efficient workflow, in fact, compared to traditional modeling systems. 
I do agree with that because when when we had like super noisy models, for example, it's really difficult in classical desktop systems to find exact problematic face or, or vertex, and with with VR, you just stick your head into it and you find it exactly where you want it. So I see the problem I can see is scaling the system into more functionality. I guess do you have any plans for adding more? You know, like you mentioned Blender. Blender has like five thousand different things to do. How would you? Would you have there is some stop state where you will be happy with enough functionality, or is there some plan of actually adding more fluffy functionality to this? Yeah, no, I, I think that that you have to be a little bit, you know, diehard purist uh, if you create a system like that, and this means, of course, that it will never be able to do all of the things that that Blender can do, and I think it's. It's important to be be sort of uh, honest with yourself about that. That you have to limit, you have to cap the functionality. And that that being said, though, I think that that you can you can round off the feature set a bit more. Especially symmetry by sensing these these features. I can see we can round off so they become more powerful. And I also think we want to do. I mentioned this a little bit, but you can do degree of freedom separation on the faces. For instance, if you if if you move your hand towards a face horizontally then you could maybe rotate around a horizontal axis. If you move it vertically, the handle would then also be vertical and you would rotate around a, a vertical axis. So in this way, I think things can be, you know, rounded off nicely. It's fantastic, you know. As, as, also, as a starting point, like you showed that you start building it in your thing and then you finish it in, in other tools. So it's, it's absolutely, I think, amazing. Do right, we have any other questions, guys? Well, let's thank Mr. Berenson. Thank you.